I said, good evening, officer. What's, what, did I do something wrong when I pulled out from the ATM? And the first thing he says to me is, don't play dumb with me. In this world where a woman's safety should be a given, it's baffling that some who wear the badge to protect can wield it as a weapon. Tackling this issue means reshaping the system to be a beacon of hope, not a source of despair. Get ready for heart-wrenching tales that will leave an indelible mark on your soul. Were these officers held accountable for their actions, or did they escape consequences? Stay tuned to uncover the riveting twists. In a troubling incident detailed in court documents, former New Orleans Police Department officer Rodney Vickner, age 55, found himself entangled in a deeply disturbing case. He was sentenced in federal court to 14 years in prison for sexually assaulting a 15-year-old crime victim in violation of her constitutional rights. It all began in May 2020, when in his capacity as a police officer, he accompanied a then 14-year-old girl to the hospital for a forensic exam known as a rape kit, following her sexual assault by another man. Vicnair during this time went beyond his role as an officer, offering the victim his cell phone number and claiming to be her friend and mentor. In the ensuing months, they frequently spoke on the phone and exchanged messages on Snapchat. Wearing his uniform, Vicnair made unannounced visits to the victim's home, gradually transitioning into making unsettling and sexually suggestive comments. The most harrowing episode unfolded on the night of September 23, 2020, when Vicnair arrived at the victim's residence. By then, she had turned 15. He convinced her to enter his vehicle, locked the doors, and instilling fear subjected her to sexual assault by touching her genitals without her consent under her clothing. In court, Vicnair admitted that his actions were devoid of any legitimate law enforcement purpose, acknowledging their wrongfulness and their violation of the law. Yet, he engaged in them nonetheless. Throughout several months, the lawsuit alleges that Vicnair repeatedly visited the girl and raped her at least twice. We are grateful to this young survivor for coming forward, even though she thought no one would believe her, said Assistant Attorney General Kristen Clark of the Justice Department's Civil Rights Division. Had she not been willing to do so, we would not have been able to hold the defendant accountable for his heinous crime. This case should send a strong message to law enforcement officers who sexually abuse victims, particularly children, that they are not above the law and will be held accountable. Now, if you're wondering what his past history is, let's talk about it. In 2020, Vic Nair was arrested and initially entered a guilty plea in the hope of securing a reduced seven-year sentence. However, this plea agreement was not approved by the judge. A subsequent plea deal was negotiated, leading to a 14-year prison term along with five years of supervised release. Currently, Vic Nair is serving his 14-year sentence behind bars. Does a 14-year prison sentence truly deliver justice for the victim and society? If you found this story dark, brace yourself for the next tale that will leave you utterly astonished. Sarah Everard was walking home from a friend's house in Clapham, South London at about 21.30 p.m. on the 3rd of March, 2021, when she was abducted. Seven days later, Everard's remains were discovered in a woodland near Kent on the 10th of March following their identification. Wayne Cousins was charged with her kidnapping and murder. Cousins was a Metropolitan Police Constable. What actually happened to Sarah? In a chilling revelation, it has come to light that the police officer had meticulously planned a violent sexual assault, targeting a yet-to-be-selected victim whom he intended to force into his custody. Over the course of at least a month, Cousins undertook research trips from Deal, Kent, where he resided, to London in preparation for his crimes. Several days prior to the harrowing attack, he made arrangements, booking a hire car for the purpose of abduction and ordered a roll of self-adhesive film, advertised as carpet protector from Amazon. While his choice of victim was seemingly random, the attack itself was chillingly calculated. Following a grueling 12-hour shift at the U.S. Embassy, Cousins embarked on what he termed a hunt for a lone young woman to abduct. He used his police warrant card and handcuffs to coerce Sarah Everard, a 33-year-old, into his vehicle as she walked home in South London. This occurred during the stringent COVID lockdown restrictions in March, possibly providing the pretext for his intervention. From there, Cousins transported Miss Everard to Dover in Kent, transferring her to his personal car before heading to a remote rural area nearby. It was in this desolate location that he committed the heinous act 
raping and ultimately murdering his victim by strangling her with his own police belt. After Sarah Everard went missing, the very next day, some very disturbing things happened. The person responsible, Cousins, bought petrol to burn her body in a refrigerator. He also got two large bags to hide her remains in a pond near a place he owned in Ashford. On March 9, 2021, Cousins was arrested in Deal Kent, initially on suspicion of kidnapping Sarah Everard, which later extended to encompass suspicion of murder. On June 8, 2021, he entered a guilty plea to charges of kidnapping and rape, accepting responsibility for her tragic fate. Subsequently, on July 9th, he admitted to her murder. As a result, Cousins was sentenced to life in prison on September 30th, 2021. I just wasn't myself anymore. I was angry. I was always hurt. There would be times I would be afraid to leave my house. The fear just wouldn't go away. Sometimes it feels like it just happened a week ago, said Gianna Anderson to the media. What traumatic event in Anderson's life left her so fearful and scared? The years-long case began because of a traffic stop on the night of October 16, 2015. Prior to that evening, Anderson had never experienced an arrest. A dedicated healthcare credentialing worker and longtime resident of Phoenix, she had ventured out to collect allergy medication and withdraw cash from an ATM. However, her life took a sharp turn when she heard the screech of tires and noticed a police SUV make a U-turn to follow her. It was Anthony Armour from Phoenix Police Department. He swiftly informed her that her license was suspended, dismissing her attempts to explain a motor vehicle document issue. Anderson wanted someone to witness what was happening, but the officer said no. She tried to record the encounter on her phone, but couldn't start the recording in time. I said, good evening, officer. What's, what, did I do something wrong when I pulled out from the ATM? And the first thing he says to me is, don't play dumb with me. As the situation escalated, the officer's behavior took a horrifying turn. He forcefully grabbed her by the wrist, pulling her out of the car and then pinned her against the vehicle. He proceeded to handcuff her and began an invasive and inappropriate search. His actions included running his hand under her clothing, cupping her breast, and delving into her pockets and shockingly down her pants and thigh. All of this left Anderson in a state of severe distress and she felt a loss of control over the situation. As she was moved into the back of the police car, she couldn't help but think of another black woman, Sandra Bland, who had experienced a similar situation during a traffic stop and tragically died in police custody just three months prior. Despite her deteriorating health and well-founded fears, the officers on the scene did not take her health concerns seriously. Instead, they chose to dismiss her condition. Anderson pleaded with them not to leave her alone with the officer who had subjected her to such a traumatic ordeal, but her plea went unanswered. Eventually, she was taken to the Phoenix jail and charged with resisting arrest, facing the grim prospect of a six-month sentence and a substantial fine. You can't even put words to that kind of fear I was facing, said Anderson, now 52. I didn't think I was going to live through it. A few weeks following Anderson's distressing arrest, Officer Armour found himself accused once more, this time for forcefully entering a home without proper authorization and arresting a woman inside. The police department subsequently determined that he was guilty of false arrest, unlawful entry, insubordination toward a supervisor, and making multiple false statements. In response, he received an 80-hour suspension. During this time, Anderson knew she wasn't alone in her experience, and she decided to file her case against Armour, providing a detailed account of her assault. He was approved for early retirement in 2021 at the age of 40, with a monthly pension of $3,143. Anderson's life unraveled after her assault. Her relationship fell apart, she became too anxious to drive alone at night, and shut down the fitness wear business she was launching. How is it that the perpetrator enjoys a content retirement with a monthly pension while the victim continues to grapple with fear and trauma? These are cases we've become aware of, but it's possible that these same officers may have victimized many others as well. Leave a comment with your thoughts on these cases and subscribe to the channel for more content like this.